All right. All right. Uh, hallelujah. Um, so this is part two of this little series about a hybrid model of grid cells. Um, last time, just to remind you quickly, we were talking about an oscill oscillatory interference model. Um, the, um, and I you know, showed you this little idea of combining um, intrinsic membrane oscillation with dendritic oscillators that are essentially uh, velocity controlled oscillations in a specific direction. So one could also think of them as speed attenuated head direction cells, essentially, that are uh, fluctuating at theta. And then it turns out that kind of a model can very nicely explain um, a lot of the, the important byproducts of building this grid. So not just build a stable grid with a stable scale, but also carry all these weird phenomena of uh, theta and theta precession um, and um, so account for them by essentially establishing carry and an envelope. Uh, we did the math for this 1D example there, uh, even though of course the model was then 2D and a little bit more complicated and there are caveats and one can talk forever about it. Just wanted to quickly remind you of that. I, had a, I, so had a, the, I wanted to ask you a question about it. Um, sure. And I might have asked this during the last meeting, but I forgot. Um, the way the models proposed is that you had different dendritic branches that were actually at different sort of um, independent um, phases or, or frequencies. Mm -hmm. And the question, which is a very interesting hypothesis, but it's a very, very uh, uh, sp specific biological uh, proposal that the question is, is there, was there any empirical evidence to support that idea that the different branches, I know there were multiple branches, but beyond that, uh, was there any evidence to support that they are actually operating at these different frequencies? Um, I am not aware of um, intracellular recordings that would record different intracellular um, uh, potentials for the different dendrites to show that explicitly. But the kinds of cells that you would need for the inputs to that, these theta cells that um, uh, are velocity dependent in a specific direction, those have been found. Yeah. So the necessary inputs for it exist. The morphology of these stellate cells would fit that idea. The intrinsic membrane oscillation exists and is well described and reliable. Again, but so the, all uh, the but pieces the, for it exist. The yeah, but still, even having, those, even having those, even having those progenitor um, uh, cells is, is still a big leap to getting the different dendrites to go at different frequencies. So I'm, I, you've answered my question. Mm -hmm. I, I, I still going to put that into the uh, highly speculative realm then. Uh, right. Until someone's met or something like that. Right. Okay. Um, I, gu I guess what makes the oscillatory inf interference model uh, so interesting is mostly that it can account for so much of what is being No, I, I, love the, I love the model, right? True, right? Remember, I love the model. Right. It's, just, it's that specific part of it, which is what the part I was having trouble with. Right. Right. Um, so you can have an oscillated interference model that doesn't have those, the, those different dendrites running around. Right. So the most common critique of the oscillatory inf interference model uh, has always been. Not so much that it requires these velocity-controlled oscillations um, or that it would be possible to put it together like that, but that in order for this to work, all of these oscillators need to be very pure sine waves and they, because the model is very sensitive to phase shifts. Or you need to imagine some intricate mechanism that kind of updates the model all the time with precise information. But then what is the point of having a navigation system that needs to be corrected all the time by an uh, observer that knows perfect location? Um, which is actually a critique that uh, Burak and uh, Fiat made explicitly in this model, which proposes instead a continuous attractor neural network model and makes arguments uh, specifically, you know, for that model and against oscillatory interference. Uh, that doesn't mean that they, you know, like say like this is the only model possible or anything. Obviously, the, the modeling world has also evolved. Um, but they try to point out some of the weaknesses. And the thing that they hone in on is the amount of debt reckoning that a rat can do. So um, they're talking about the full range over which rats are capable of accurate dead reckoning, behavioral studies document the rats can compute the straight path home following random foraging trajectories that are one to three meters in length in the absence of external sensory cues. Right? So how does this model um, sort of keep going for this long? Um, and the question is, would that be compatible with, a, with an oscillatory interference model? So can I ask you a question about mm -hmm. that? 
Um, I mean, that the, the word you just said, don't tell me how accurate it is. No. Um, so again, I've done these, you know, you just do this yourself, right? You get up in the middle of the night, you're in the dark, you know where you are, and then you start walking. Right. And, and then you could very quickly get a sense of how uncertain you are in your location. And I find I've never been able to have any kind of certainty at all. As soon as I start walking, the, the errors in my day reckoning get really large very quickly. And I've never been able to say, oh, I can walk 15 feet or 10 feet over there and know where I am. It's like, as soon as I start walking, I'm like, oh, I'm not really certain anymore. I'm over here, sort of, and it gets bigger and bigger. So it, but to say these are accurate, I, my personal introspection says I'm not accurate at all. Right. Um, are these saying the rats are accurate? Are they, are they better well, than I am? Right. Uh, they, are, they are making this argument in order to propose a model that is presumably much better at accurate path integration. The so question is, you specifically do they know that the rats are really good at path integration? Uh, is that really been proven? It's hard to say because you cannot exclude, you know, all factory cues perfectly. Oh, well, like, you cannot exclude well, you can. like, you can sonic, try to design sonic cues. Yeah, you, you can, can try you can design to design experiment experiments and get rid of them. Right. So the question: Have they done that? Right. No. Okay. Um, but but they make an argument that the oscillatory interference model is too vulnerable, and that that argument I think is valid in the sense that the oscillatory interference model gains a lot of precision. Right. Remember that the exact theta phase of the spike gives you not just information now that you are in the firing field because you have a spike, but it also gives you information how far into the firing field you are now. Meaning you get additional spatial information, but that additional spatial information that you get, like this massive boost to spatial um, information, actually comes at a vulnerability. And that vulnerability is that the underlying oscillators need to be really well in phase. And to that point, they, they make this exact argument here. So they say that in reality, theta oscillations are not temporary coherent, cross correlogram from in vitro intracellular recordings and in, vi in vivo extracellular recordings show that the phase of theta oscillation in entorhinal cortex typically decoheres or slips by half a cycle. So half a cycle would be destructive, obviously, yeah. in less than 10 cycles or about one second, right? Theta is about 10 hertz. So 10 cycles is about one, one second, yeah. which corresponds to a distance of one meter for run velocity of one meter per second. This means uh, that the model grid cells will entirely lose track of the correct phase for the present wrap position within that time. Just, right? just, that just says, it just on its own, these things will decohere. Uh, and, which is interesting because once you know your location, mm -hmm. uh, even in the dark, it doesn't drift, right? right. So, your perception of where I am is never drifts because if you don't move, you just know you're in the same location. And somehow, so that there's a there's a strong evidence that once you, once you have a location, it doesn't drift. But mm -hmm. the evidence I have is that once you start moving, it gets really really wonky quickly. Um, it all makes sense to me. It, it's a useful system in that regard. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's unuseful. And the idea that you have to constantly uh, reconnect to the environment to know where you are accurately is fine. Um, okay. So I guess I'm just trying to make sure that, yeah. the, that they're trying to solve the right problem here. One problem to me is like, you don't want this thing to drift when you're stationary, mm -hmm. but when you do move, I, it's okay to drift. Um, and right. so uh, maybe that's, just want to make that mm -hmm. distinction um, right. in my mind. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to properly lay out the perspective that this paper sort of brings forward and try to uh, advance. Yeah, I'm trying to understand that perspective exactly, right. the details matter here. Right. So this is obviously like the introduction, right? And so with regards to this idea that, well, okay, it's fine if we decohere every 10th cycle, if we have some way of, you know, either pooling information so we can average it out or, um, or readjusting it by phase resets from play cells or other like environmental cues, right? Uh, they say quite simply, conceptually, the existence of an integrating apparatus seems pointless if it is completely dependent on near continuous corrections coming from an external source that specifies absolute position. Thus, it seems reasonable to require the theoretical models of path integration in dorsal medial entorhinal cortex if, faith, if using faithful velocity inputs have the ability to reproduce stable grid cell patterns for trajectories lasting a few minutes. Now, I think that minutes is like, you know, way over the mark, <laughs> yeah, similar yeah. To, uh, to, to Jeff's yeah, observations. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to separate this into two parts. Mm -hmm. The stability when you're not moving has to be really rock solid. Mm -hmm. And then this is the, and this is stability when you're moving seems to get wacky really quickly. Right. And I don't think that's a problem. That's still useful. Uh, it is not a problem doing that. Right. 
Um, anyway, so let's get into the meat of the matter. So how is the continuous attractor neural model different? Well, if you are stationary, um, it, it's really quite a, quite a simple model at first. You just assume that all these different cells that you have spanning out a sheet, so maybe this is a sheet of media entorhinal cortex, um, have these um, ring inhibition, so like a center surround kind of a thing, where the cells in their vicinity are inhibited, but not when they're very close by. So you can imagine, you know, like these things have been observed in um, like uh, visual cortex V1. You have like cells that, you know, have connectivity profiles like that. Bit of a Mexican head kind of thing. Um, that's not like unreasonable to imagine. But the interesting thing about an architecture like that would, of course, be that um, as soon as you introduce this without any dynamics, without talking about position updating, integrating velocity inputs or anything, you already get a grid because now neurons that are close together, right, can, can interact and neurons that are a little apart inhibit each other. So that means you automatically get this network where active nodes are pushing against each other and you get, when you, when you do that, right, similar to just dropping balls into an empty basin, you're automatically going to get a hexagonal packed grid because that is the optimal way that uh, circular things will arrange when they push off each other. So that is a very neat mechanism of just generating a hexagonal pattern. Now note that that's not, the, that's not the grid cell response part. That's just physically the cells responding in a uh, yes. in the sheet of tissue. Right, right. and that yeah. is a super important um, observation already. So we need to be very careful that we don't confuse the population activity pattern, which is a very nice hexagonal grid here, with the receptive field of the cells in that tissue. Right? In, in that field. So, because right now this is static, right? All the neurons that are firing are firing and all the neurons that are silent are silent. Um, so this is sort of a stable grid, right? So one of the first things that this continuous attractor um, model does, it just generates a very nice stable grid in the population response. Now, obviously you want to integrate inputs and the way that you do this now is you say, well, inside this sheet, the cells have a direction preference. And depending on the direction preference, they actually don't have their center surround inhibition there uh, spaced out as a perfect ring, but it's slightly shifted. So if, let's say, you had a westward input, then the, all the red cells right, would bias this stable attractor to drift towards the left because the cells just to the left of this red cell are slightly less inhibited. And so the entire population activity of the network is now gonna to start to drift in that direction. The interesting thing about that is of course that if these cells are inside the tissue, then they will also build uh, actual uh, path integration inside the, the, the tissue because now the, the firing response of these neurons that are firing inside this sheet will also be a hexagonal pattern because you're moving a hexagonal pattern over them at a certain speed. So you now require that there are cells with different direction selectivity and they have a rather specific um, inhibitory connection profile that is velocity and direction tuned. So you have somehow the amplitude of, of, um, of this uh, direction selectivity is you know, somehow velocity controlled. And then depending on the direction of the inputs they're receiving, they have a different, different projection, right? So that this, their inhibitory surround that they are building through disynaptic inhibition is somehow shifted. Now that is very engineered, but it works very nicely. So, a uh, very straightforward implementation of this was actually done by Marcus, since we have internet now. Maybe this will have a quick question on that. So, in the oscillatory model, we're looking at temporal interference. Here, it looks like we're looking at spatial phase interference. You said moving the hexagonal grid over the hexagonal grid? Over, you're moving, no, you're moving the hexagonal grid over just the population of cells. Which happen to be in a, a hexagonal right. pattern. Well, the, the, the cells can be arranged anyway. So in this case, right, the implementation that Marcus did here, right, is just these cells are actually organized in a perfect grid. And you see at every spot, you have four cells. 
So each of those cells has an inhibitory surround that is slightly shifted in one of the directions, depending on the input that it uh, responds to. And that would mean that one network can now follow, right, path integrate, and, uh, and give you this, this very nice behavior. So, so where the I, I want to ask about this. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, I mentioned last time, the, uh, the comment by Haslamo where he said, oh, the problem with the, um, you know, the problem with this method is that it takes too many cells. So like here, if I look at the bump of activity is all these red cells, right, mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of cells there. It's like 16,000? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just in the bump? No, no, total. Um, and no, but in that bump there, problem. there's each of those red dots is four cells. So we, yeah. you know, and again, when you look at the tank paper I keep referring to, there's very few cells in the bump. It's, it's you know, it's really small. So that was Haslamo's observation Oh, I'm sorry. We're not looking at the bump here. We're looking at the Mexican hat. The bump will be in another simulation. So you see in red, you see the inhibition. The question is... Um, you, you'll, you'll be able to make your point in the next video. Okay. Right. So, All right. Okay, we can go uh, to the grid. Is that, that the one? So here you'll up. actually see the bump. My point is. All right. Um, these are the bumps. So this would be a network that receives southward and eastward input. So can we just freeze that for a moment when you... This free point. Right. Freezing is easy, right? Um, yeah. So, again, I'm just trying to understand this. I'm not making a point, but I'm just trying to understand it. Um, we look at that tank paper. There are very, very few cells involved in the, the entire arrangement here. Um, and so from one, one bump to the next. So he showed, like, six of those um, phase clusters. And they are, they are space, like you see here. Uh, it would be like six of these bumpy things here. But uh, there didn't seem to be enough cells to implement this type of um, um, inhibition, which is, this is Hasselhoff's argument. I will, I will talk about why so many cells are needed, why this could not be done with less. I will. Uh, well, that's his point. His point was, you can't do it with less, mm -hmm. and I'm not arguing about that. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, his point, you can't do it with less, and that was, he says, that just sort of throws this theory out the window, because mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, the observation is that there are fewer cells. Right. We will so, talk about that. Okay, all just right. So I'm just laying pressure. the groundwork here, so I'm just making sure I understand it correctly. Okay. And, um, and so you're agreeing that you're agreeing with Haskell that can't be done with fewer cells, uh, or a lot, a lot fewer cells. Right, there, that's one of the major problems of the control okay. research. Okay, all right. No, no, come on. All right. um, so just to clarify that everybody understands the mechanism here, right? So of these four cells that, uh, that um, are arranged right, to, to form like every little dot here, you see that two of them are active, right? Marcus marked them in black, I guess. And so uh, like the southward, the southward and the eastward cells are active and their inhibition is slightly to the top left when you combine their inhibitory surrounds, right? Because the eastward cell will you know, drive activity eastward by putting inhibition to slightly to the left. Um, and so because of that, this otherwise stable hexagonal grid, which you just get by the inhibitory surround, now starts drifting. And if you make the input to these cells velocity dependent, then this, the activity in this network will drift at the speed of the, of the animal, such that you get receptive fields that are perfectly nice hexagons, they're very nice, super stable, and they integrate velocity so that you can do path integration without too much uh, loss, right? Obviously, if you have any amount of noise, the numbers here matter because if you have noise, let's say, in your velocity or in the resolution of your head direction, right? Maybe it's not spot perfect. Maybe sometimes, you know, when it should be southbound, it also activates a little bit of east and westbound. Um, and then you have to question how does the network filter that? And there's really, I think, um, the one important thing is that if there's any amount of noise locally here, the whole network will push against that. So let's say if some of the cells in this bump here were off, right? So they have inputs that are just wrong. They might try to, you know, move the activity bump in some direction, but all the other bumps here, right? This one and this one and this one would like resist that and push back against it. Such that this network requires an immense amount of robustness, which is the reason why they can argue for minutes of path integration in this model by the fact that all the errors are compensated because the drift in this, in this model is not a cell-by-cell -cell drift, it's the whole network that moves. Um, which is really very different from the oscillatory interference model, which is a, cell, a single cell model. 
So whereas the continuous attractor neural model always talks about the relationship between grid cells and makes precise predictions about them um, and generates stability and robustness from that, the oscillatory interference model cannot because the oscillatory interference model is a single cell model and it only talks about the receptive field of this one cell and how it comes about through its oscillatory inputs. So that is uh, like a very big difference I, I hope you appreciate. Um, because of that, um, no, let's, uh, let's do one thing first. So uh, one of the interesting things that, so while, while this model makes the point that you could do lots of path integration for a long time here, and the drift, so the amount of error that you accumulate over a long time, right, these are like, you know, hundreds of seconds, right, is relatively small compared to, what is it, like a 50 centimeter grid period here, right? So the argument being that this network can be dead reckoning for a long time. What you already saw in the very first video by Marcus, though, is that this relies on a periodic network. So such that the cells that are on the right side here, right, which have the activity bumps here, actually project the inhibition not just to the boundary, but a little bit over to the next bump. If you don't have a periodic network that is sort of a torus, right, like wrapped onto itself in both dimensions, then you, um, how shall we say, you incur all kinds of problems. It's not clear why, mm -hmm. because um, you just pointed out a moment ago your error is average over all the bumps, and so mm -hmm. now you're gonna have some, some bumps on the edge are errored. Mm -hmm. they, they, they just don't have the boundary and they're just right. going to be. So, but the rest of the bumps are gonna to try to keep them in control. They're going to, the rest mm -hmm. of the bumps are gonna say, okay, they, uh, you may be confused, but we're not. So why isn't that compensate for that? Right, the, the problem with this model is that it responds perfectly linear to the speed, right? So in the absence of any input, it will drift if, if all the summed contribution of the entire network isn't net zero. So imagine, imagine, yeah, 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 imagine a very little network, right? So I just draw a little grid here. Uh, let's say you have a couple of grid nodes. So this is like a you know, nice packed hexagonal pattern, something like this, right? And now you say, okay, look, maybe, uh, maybe you have this boundary here. So like just that these cells just are barely cut off. So now you are missing the, the positive input here that would prevent this bump from drifting here, from drifting downward, right? Yeah, but you got the same thing going on the other boundary. And so, I mean, the point is, if, if I had a large enough sheet, mm -hmm. right, that the larger number, the more bumps I have, the, the smaller the error, uh, the effective error of the edges are going to be. Mm -hmm. Right, so it, it given, you can, whatever yeah. argument you're going to make here, I can argue that similar boundary pushing on the other side, so, I would, I would say that the system's gonna be stable. It, it'll be stable as long as enough of these bumps in the middle, these, these are larger than the number of bumps on the outside. Right. And, and how many bumps do we need? I don't know, but the point right. is, it doesn't matter. The point yeah. is that you don't have to have a toroidal uh, effect here, mm -hmm. because that seems very unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you have enough bumps in a big enough sheet, then it should balance out, right? Right. Okay. Um, that is true. So if you build a network with, um, I think they, they um, concluded that they need something like 10,000 neurons, then this is going to be fine. The network is not going to rotate and the network is not going to... 10,000 neurons total? 10,000 neurons total is what you need. In including inhibitory neurons? Yeah. Uh, no, this is the, the whole network is inhibitory, right? I mean, uh, well, disynaptic inhibition by the well, inhibitors these are, around. We're assuming these are uh, excitatory cells, these that are inhibiting each other, right? The stellar cells inhibit each other through yeah, this. Yeah, so that's just different types of cells. You have right. like stellar cells that are excitatory. Each, each yeah. little point had four extra cells. It, there's five at each point. Mm -hmm. So this includes all of those things. The, those, those were, there were just four at each point. Uh, there, there weren't five at each point. Oh, oh okay. But there, is, there has to be inhibitory cells as well, right? Or, yeah. yeah. So one of the ways to, so to just avoid... So 10,000 is how did that number come about? How many bumps does that assume? What is that, what is this, where does that come from? Just roughly, I mean... You know, how do they reach that number? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. What was, what was this uh, to me? <laughs> um, so, I'm sorry. Could you repeat your question? Well, how did they come up with the number 10,000? Oh, um, so they observed that this network has a tendency to rotate. Um, this has to do, obviously, with exactly this. Rotate this or drift? 
Well, it's a kind of drift, right? So, oh, wow. it, which has obviously not been observed experimentally, which is why this is a major problem. Because um, the orientation of the grid is, you know, very reliable, right? And so, and more if you have two grid cells with the same phase always have the same phase, uh, and that, that if, if, you, if the if the slide is rotated, suddenly different pairs of grid cells would have would have the same phase. Well, why why is the lattice rotating? I mean, that was a new idea. We haven't heard this. Before. It's for the exact same reason that it might uh, that it might not be you know, perfectly steady if it's not big enough. For if you cut away right by a boundary some part of the network, yeah. then the inhibition that was projected from this neuron out here okay. is now gone. Yeah, these are boundary factors, which means okay, that these it. cells are going to drift over here got it, got it, got to it. change okay. the orientation. Right. So boundary effects uh, again are uh, will cause all kinds of problems, right. and, and the extent that the boundary is a larger portion of the whole network, and the more you have, right? And the way that they overcome that is by tapering off at the edges. So they're saying that the whole connectivity uh, just goes soft at the boundaries. So somehow they, they sort of like define themselves a circle in which all of the network behaves as it should. But then towards the edge, whatever connections are going to go outward here, right? they're just going to become like very weak. Which is obviously like very engineering kind of a solution. Like, how would that even work? In and that also means there's a lot of cells that aren't really participating in the, in and the it's, coding. And it's wasteful, right? And it turns out that even if you do taper, so here's an example of a tapered network, um, where you see sort of like these these connectivity profile here towards the edge, they they taper it off, right? So you only get a perfect grid here in the middle. Um, so these cells are going to have very nice grid fields, and the cells here are kind of just on for the right. <laughs> um, even then, you get a slow drift in the orientation. Of course, this is over many minutes, right? This is uh, like a 1,200 seconds, so that's like, uh, what's that, 20 minutes? Uh, that's a long time, but it goes to show that this network by its own is not very nice and stable. They then do some interesting math to also show that this network also has the problem if it's too small and has tapered edges, that actually the network is going to resist small velocity inputs. So the network will only update properly at uh, slightly higher energies because there's ripples on the energy surface that have to do with these boundaries effects, which resist the movement of the network. And so the, um, I don't intend to go into the detailed math of all of this to, to like try to explain where these weird boundary effects and the distortions that they bring come with. But the main conclusion that you, that you get from this is that unless the network is periodic, it's not really, it doesn't really do the one thing that the continuous attractor neural network was, model was built for, that it was supposed to do, namely be perfectly stable against um, the, the, the translations and rotations. Right? Can, I, can I make another observation mm -hmm. here? Um, you know, I, I think the, the thing about these grid cells outside of the place cells is, 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 is not the right, right thing to do. We have to think about them interacting constantly. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously, if you're in a dark room and you're walking, you don't have any place information. You can't get that stuff, and so you're relying on path integration. But I'm imagining <clears throat> what, if, I, if I'm in some position and the lights go off, and I'm uh, and I have this very stable representation of where I am. Uh, that stability could come from the grid cells themselves, which you're trying to address here. But it doesn't have to. You could have you could have a temporary memory in the place cells. So I imagine myself in, in a room in my house, and, um, and the lights go off, and I'm standing there for a while, and I want to think about where I am. What I imagine in my head is the last thing I saw. It's like, oh, I was standing next to the bed looking in this direction. And that, I might have a very, all I require in that case to be permanently anchored is a, a non-drifting anchoring system is to imagine or recall the last place I was in, like the last place cells, and that would re-anchor the grid cells. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily require that the grid cells themselves are stable, and um, mm -hmm. which is interesting because I'm in a, a, a very strange environment. This time I'm in a room that I don't know where I am, and I've just I've entered this big box, okay, and I see I'm in the corner of the box, and now I start uh, I see I'm going to walk someplace, and I, the lights go off, I have nothing else to see. I, I walk some distance, I don't really know where I am. If I just stand there for a while, my perception of where I am in that room would, would drift. It would all of a sudden think, well, maybe I was over here, maybe I was over there. Was even right. and so I'm wondering if the stability is not coming from the grid cells themselves, but it's coming from the place cells and place cells of right. temporary memory that do right. that. Exactly, which is 
exactly the argument that the oscillatory interference model makes to overcome the problem of the of the of the face. But I was well, my, the difference I'm adding right now is I don't have to have a constant refreshing of sensory data. Right. Um, that was the thing that was tripping me up a moment ago. I said, yeah, how do I get to stability? The stability could be done because I just have a short term memory of my sensory data mm -hmm. and that's good enough. Okay. Right. So essentially this is talking about, you know, this this bidirectional interaction between yes. grid cells and play cells and how they might inform each other. Um, this is obviously it's an academic exercise to sort of, you know, study this rather a uh, simple idea of like this this architecture, right? Um, and and study all the ways in, in which it's right and wrong. Um, and it turns out if you build this model big enough, it's actually very nicely path integrates for minutes at a time. I think they conclude that like their ten thousand neural models like keeps total error, you know, for like two hundred sixty meters and twenty minutes under under sort of half the grid length. I think less than 15 centimeters um, error in a, in a 48 centimeter grid. So meaning, you know, this, this model could probably like, you know, be reasonable for half an hour or something, which is astonishing, right? Uh, and I'll, um, point out, I, I'll point out that like, that's, that might seem implausible. You might say that there's no way anything can path integrate for that long. Um, but here we're just talking about the error in the grid cell system itself. Right. There are still velocity errors. Uh, this thing's not going to correct velocity errors. If you get a wrong signal from your vestibular system, this is not going to correct that. So, like, if, if you if you introspect and say that, like, I'm really bad at path integrating, that therefore this can't be me. Uh, this still can be you. Right. That yeah, that's sense. a that's a that's an important point to make. I'm just thinking, like, you know, when you wake up in the morning and it's dark, let's say it's pitch black, and um, uh, you know where you are. Right? I mean, I've been sleeping for eight hours, and I can know where I am. And the yeah, way no, I that, do, that makes sense. That's all. That's all. Fine. That's why I'm just saying that again. I'm going back to the point I made earlier. Yeah. How do I do that? I re recall. Oh, I'm, I'm in bed, and this is where I sleep in the bed, and this is why I went to bed last night. It's funny because I have two homes, in, and sometimes I have two beds, and sometimes I get confused. You know, you wake up in the morning, and you think you're in the other bed, and all of a sudden you're in the wrong spot, and you start walking in the wrong direction. Uh, I'm just again, I'm going back to this point where um, I, this idea that we require stability from the grid cells, I think, is is uh, is false. I don't think it's required. Right. Which is um, right. Which is an argument in models that focus on other things. Right. Um, anyways, so the the point was um, that even in this continuous attractive neural network model, right, accurate path integration for this long time. Right, requires attention to details and tuning, as they call it. Right? And that is even true in a deterministic network with perfectly organized inhibitory surrounds of, of this kind of sh that you see in this figure here. Right? So the kind of network that Marcus implemented, uh, which is just an implementation of this model. Right? Um, and so, um, so this model itself, even even though that is you know possible with like tapering off the edges and making the network big enough, obviously has a couple of problems. I, I wanted to mention a couple of them. Um, so that would be page five. That's too far. So in the reality of morphology, would argue that you don't have a periodic network. That you don't have these cross connections coming across. We'll time. talk about that in a second. Okay. Um, uh, where do I want here? That's weird. Ah, here we go. So the first thing obviously is that recording population activity at different times reveals that the population pattern rotates. Um, oh, in the model. In the model. Right, in, yeah, the, model. in, the, in yeah. the model, right? Which is a violation of what's been observed experimentally. And then further that um, the flow rate of the grid pattern is not precisely proportional to the rat's velocity. In particular, rat velocities below approximately 10 centimeters per second, there's no flow at all, and the network is pinned, which has also not been observed experimentally. You can have a rat moving very slowly, it could still yeah. update correctly. Right. Um, so, and then they show, where is it here? Um, for a given tapering of inputs at the boundary, increasing the size of the network reduces pinning and improves the linearity of the network, velocity response, which is how they get to this thing where they can integrate for 260 meters or like 20 minutes of random foraging. The next point is the thing I was making earlier, really, that the point of view, the integration performance, the larger the network, the better. That's yeah, exactly. And that's why 
if you want this to, to run well, you need a really big network yeah. of like some 10,000 neurons, which then do what in an oscillatory interference model you did with one network with, with one neuron that just has very nice oscillatory inputs. Um, another thing that is worth mentioning. Um, can't, can't, I'm just trying to jump to the head here because I'm, I'm impatient. Right. Um, can't you just make, accept the, this, this uh, hexagonal inhibitory surround, but just make it really small? Right, just you don't don't and don't require it to be stable. I and mean, what you get from this is you get you get the proper arrangement of the cells as we actually see it, like in those uh, phase clusters. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and but by, by making the network very small, you just lose all your stability. But what if we don't require that stability? What if you just say, okay, it's uh, the stability is coming from something else, right. um, and therefore you know I don't need a large network. I can do this a very small network. Right, fine, fine. So build a small network that actually has a tendency to rotate and that has a tendency to sometimes get... But it won't, for the reasons, I, yeah, 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 no, no, for the reasons no. I told you. So I don't care about that. Right. Yeah, if I just isolate the so cells by themselves... So this is just a component network, network, right, and a network that has ways of error correcting through play cells, then couldn't you just implement a smaller version of this with, you know, 100 or 1,000 cells instead um, that by its own would have all kinds of fault, but they don't show up because they're yeah. part of an integrated yeah. thing. Right. Um, that's a perfectly uh, reasonable argument, I think, and it would be interesting to see how that would work. They did not implement this here, so they don't have integrated place cells that would, you know, update uh, when the, the, the network... I mean, the gets empirical started, evidence suggests pinned. that that's what we do have. They don't have an automatic way to cancel out the inherent rotation of the network because of the boundary effects. Marcus, didn't the, the, wasn't, the, wasn't there a Surya Bengali lab paper on... I think that it would initially would ring attractors where they would use right. the sensory information to kind of stabilize stuff. And they mostly, the, yes, they, and they, they did mostly a smaller did, network. I think. They, they used a, um, I can't speak to the number of cells they did in the network because most of their simulation they didn't model the CAN. They they did this whole thing with like uh, with they they did a model reduction where they did it up in like the language of um, of. Like springs and stuff. So you know, I can't answer your question of how many neurons they use once they added this, this the the, board, the boundary cells and such that could pin the phase. Um, so I don't know. Right. Um, one more thing I want to mention um, before I get to the sort of some of the other problems uh, also between oscillatory interference and and the CAM model is. Um, there's all these interesting findings of uh, grid distortions and grid expansion. So, for example, when you put rats in a novel environment, the grid is suddenly larger. And you might think at first that this is a problem for this model because somehow the scale of the grid, right, the period or the spatial period of this population pattern is actually fixed by this inhibitory surround. And so somehow you would need to have a, imagine a model where the inhibitory surround of cells you know, expands or contracts. But that is actually a misreading of the model, because in fact, of course, what you see here is not yeah, that's the not, receptor that's field, not, the right? point that yeah. Jeff already made early on. I just wanted to make to remind everybody of that, so that if you, the only thing you require to make this uh, grid scale is to modulate the amplitude of these uh, velocity inputs. Yeah. So if you increase the flow rate of this population pattern over the neurons, then, of course, the individual receptive fields of the individual grid cells will have a much more compact grid pattern. And you could do vice versa. You can make it flow very slowly with like a lower collinear torque. The interesting torque. question is why would you want a system to do this? Why would you want a system to start with these larger fields and then slowly, you know, and as you learn this, the environment gets smaller? What would be the functional advantage of that? Because I've never heard any arguments for that. Have you heard any arguments for that, Marcus? I can make some up, but nothing that's that. Good. I mean, oh. sure. You learn something in more detail. Now you want to. Uh, now you want to be able to give things more precise locations. But Therefore, but that means the stuff you learned earlier is sort of incorrect in yeah. some sense, right? So yeah, it so seems like a pretty big penalty to pay for that. Yeah, it seems like I I'm I'm going to start doing hand waving and saying like must be updated during sleep. You must be doing some kind mm -hmm. of consolidation, moving mm -hmm. stuff from one map over yeah. to the other. I mean, I had the same but, idea. Like, yeah, well, if you really don't know where you are, then a bigger grid is is a better. It'll be more useful. Um, because you don't really have any accuracy. But if you really know something detailed, you'd want to have more detail and accuracy, but it does be part of this weird thing, the changing going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
One big thing that is another concern in this continuous attractor model is obviously there's a good question how would this very specific inhibitory um, you know connections right uh, get learned for the oscillatory interference one we showed that a very simple heavy learning rule that just maximizes uh, posterior firing under exclusion of collinear inputs will generate the perfect arrangement of um, of 60 degree separated oscillators to allow you to build this nice path integration. Here instead what you require are like these tuned um, inhibitory surround profiles that are slightly shifted depending on... The tuning because each of the which, four cells has to have a different direction. Right? Exactly and of course you know in a more biological implementation maybe you have them in all kinds of directions and that's... Is that really hard to imagine? How, why is that hard to do? I mean, it's, it's the reason why it's hard to do is because this model is fooling also all of us a little bit and that it so suggests that this connectivity is a topological mapping where in reality it is not. Neighboring cells inside medial anterolinear cortex do not in fact have the same phase. In fact they can have radically different phases. Meaning um, what this model suggests well, is that again. because of... Say, say um, again. Uh, in, in I heard the words but when you say phase, what, please remind me exactly what we're talking about. Here. The spatial phase Right? Meaning, which, which the. Um, kind of the separation of the grip. Point. The separation of the grip. So, if you look, if you plot the, the firing fields yeah. of neighboring cells in this model, they're going to have almost the exact same firing field yeah. as this isogonal pattern is slowly drifting over. The tank's paper showed that they did have that. They didn't show that their phases were different on adjacent cells. Well, I, I think this is I the kind of thing where, in the past couple of years, the, the belief about this changed through the tank paper. Uh, uh, like, mm -hmm. I think what you're saying was true in everyone's mind up until about last year. Well, I know it's interesting because Tank said there was an open question. Yeah. And he didn't say this is the belief that these are not in the same phase. This is right. an open question. This, so you're right. The thing people. You, oh, yes, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so to say that. All right. I'm just. I mean, there's a false yeah. distinction here. I think. Uh, the, anyways, the, 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 the point is uh, it's quite unclear right, how, how uh, such a connectivity would be learned, like what kind of a learning rule would... Um, well, if you're assuming that all the cells are the same phase, then, then it's not so hard. You just have every cell has a similar type of inhibitory surround, and all you have to do is worry about how they get their different orientations, right? Uh, it's well, I mean, all you have to worry about that's so handy. Well, I mean, it's, first of all, I don't have to worry about the, the equal spacing because the, the, they all have the same inhibition and because uh, they are in the same phase. And then the, the and now you have to say somehow they have to have this separated um, uh, distortion. And even that, if you go to the comp if you go to the complete grid cell and play cell model, those distortions in the, in the different directions don't have to be very accurate mm -hmm. um, at all, really. Um, right. They can just be rough guidelines. I mean, I've some say it has to be learned, but I don't view it as like a, tri a tricky problem. What, what is the name of the tank paper you, you guys, we guys keep referring to? I don't know. Is anybody <laughs> I'm sure it was referred to before. Yeah, I, like, I can give you the... I can go get it if you want to my office. Uh, later. Oh, so, so, just, just so I understand, when you were talking about the phases and the orientations, where was, was the hypothesis that all the cells of the same orientation would have to be equal spacing apart from each other. In other words, you know, almost phase neutral with respect to each other. And then the other cells at a different orientation would all have to be phase neutral with respect to each other. Or it'd be. Um, I'm not sure if I understand. In other words, they would all have to have the same phase. Right, so they're... That's you know, through these you know, concepts of modules, grid cell modules, yeah. Right, but I, I'm, just, I'm just wondering because it kind of looks semi-random in that little, you know, the, the positioning, yeah. in that little square thing. So what I'm, what I'm trying to understand is, is that, say, all the red ones are on their own hexagonal pattern, and they respect that, but the, the yellow ones are in an offset Hexagonal. Yeah, they need to. Yes, they need to because, of course, this network requires right, the, the balance of inhibition to okay. be nice and equal such that your inhibitory surround will target equal amounts of cells with different orientations. So, so all the orientations, each individual one has to be on their own grid. Yeah, which, you, which you get in a very nice, like the kind of model that, that you know, 
that Marcus implemented here, right? This nice little regular grid, right? That makes sure that your inhibitory surround will hit equal amounts of cells of the different orientation types. So it needs to be perfectly uh, what you call it, uh, equally distributed. So, so, so when you were saying, when you're making the assertion that the phases were not aligned, which phases were you talking about? I'm talking about the fact that in this model, um, it predicts that neighboring, phase, neighboring grid cells always have the exact same spatial phase. Right. Yeah. And that there is a continuous mapping between the distance you go from uh, two stellar cells in medial yeah. anterior right. cortex, right, to, to the phase that that cell will have. And you're saying that, that people have argued that that, that that has not been shown. That has not been shown. Right. Okay. And right. so, so there's a good the all this mechanism requires all this topological mapping, right, on top of the periodicity or a large scale, um, in order to do this. But in fact, that kind of topology might be hidden in the connectome rather than be physically embedded in the in the structure of the sheet. And so that doesn't mean you can't develop it. It just means that the learning rules that would give rise to it are not just spatial rules that say I have an inhibitory surround and I shift it somehow, which also requires, you know, so, so some thinking. But it's more complicated than even that. So when you said topological mapping, you were really referring to a geometric mapping, right? In other words, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. And I understand. And are one of these models can I, I, just to summarize is the can. CAN model does have a physical topology of something. That's what you're saying, actually. Mm -hmm. It does, does, and then the OI model does not. Right. Okay. Typically, you could scramble this whole thing, and it would still work if somehow the connections were all. Right, but, but looking at the biology, it seems like it could be emergent from the topology of the subject yeah. itself. Yeah. Right. Um, so let's be fair to the um, oscillatory to, to the to the CAN model, and also point out in which ways the this model, the, the CAN model, is really much better. By the way, if we model, so, if we if we combine the oscillatory model and the CAN model, um, do you it, it, can we get away from the, the requirement at all that these cells uh, have this uh, uh, distorted inhibitory field? Yes, in fact, you can drop it completely. So, so, the so, so again, yeah, so it seems like that should similar. be the way to go. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm jumping. I, 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 I think this is my wait, 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 say, say that again. The whole point of these four cells have slightly disorient, you know, slightly different orientations is to get the bump to move. Yeah. Right? But if you're using the oscillatory model, the change in activity of the cells is created by something else. Yeah. Um, and therefore you wouldn't uh, the question I asked, because I wasn't certain, was that if I had if I was using a combination of basically an oscillatory model with a very small, simple um, uh, I wouldn't even call it continuous attractive, but an inhibitory surround model, mm -hmm. um, then I wouldn't require those four cells to have different orientations of the slight orientations in their field. Yes. Um, I could just say every, well, basically it's like if I have an oscillatory model where the cells have an inhibitory surround, they will naturally form a, a grid like that, the hexagonal grid, um, which is what is observed in the cortex, the tank paper, um, but I don't need to have four different types of cells that are different distorted, um, Right. So that seems like the way we're right. going to end up. Cool. Um, also, not job. Jeff is jumping ahead a little bit. I'm so impatient. I don't right. want to go I, I understand, right? <laughs> so let's point out um, a couple of the problems of the oscillatory interference model that, uh, that, that they point out. One is the problem of the stability of phase relationships. One of the nice things about linking all the cells in this sheet is that by the fact that they are part of this big sheet, which you moves you know, unanimously sort of in this one population uh, pattern that gives every cell its firing fields, it means that their phase relationships are stable, which is a known thing experimentally. So you can take rats from one environment to the other, and the phase relationship between two grid cells will stay the same. You can get a like, complete remap and completely novel environment it doesn't matter, the phase relationships between two grid cells is sort of like is about as set in stone as its spatial scale. Which is a thing that is not guaranteed in the oscillatory interference model, so it's like, you know, I purposefully uh, crossed this off here, where is it? The, the, the relative grid cell phase, right, is not guaranteed in the, in the oscillatory inference model, but it is guaranteed in the continuous attractive model because they are part of one big population pattern that links all of those. Because 
again, in the oscillatory interference model, it's an individual cell model, and there's no link between the cells, uh, other than that they might update from a, their phases occasionally from a shared pool of, uh, of place cells, maybe. And are you talking about this relative grid cell phase difference within a grid cell module? Yes. Yeah. You record two grid cells within a grid cell module. They're always going to have a certain phase relationship. And that phase relationship stays the same irrespective of environment. That is guaranteed in the CAM model. Mm -hmm. It's not guaranteed in an oscillatory interference model. In fact, it's very unlikely in an oscillatory interference model. Yeah. Um, similar things go for um, things like a relative orientation. It's quite clear that if your firing fields depend on a shared population pattern, that the orientation that you have is the same that every other cell in, in, in the entire sheet has. That is not guaranteed in an oscillatory interference model because, yes, they sample from these oscillators that go in different directions, and it turns out you don't need perfect 60 degrees, and there's a learning rule to get to 60 degrees, but that does not mean that they will sample the same directions, all of the cells. It would mean that all of the stellar cells share the exact same head direction cell, but that seems rather unlikely, so that's why I crossed it out here, but it's certainly true for the continuous attractor neural network model. That seems like... You have to have that, right? Right. You kind <laughs> of need to have models, that. sensors in space. They're going to be right. moving in different orientations right. through space. The same thing goes for stable orientation. Obviously, in the oscillatory interference model, the orientation of an individual cell can be quite stable if it just preserves all its input. That's why it's sort of like a tentative check mark. But in the in the in the continuous attractor neural model, well, you need to build a model of that is of sizable enough of a scale to avoid this slow rotation that you get in small models. But if you do that, then you can also tentatively check this off here. I already showed that obviously you get the hexagonal pattern grid. That was the easiest thing. Just inhibitory surround will give you that, give you that. Um, the scale of this is uh, quite stable. So I'm just going to try to go through this list to check our understanding here, right? Um, and the, and the uh, offsets are obviously quite stable. This, the continuous attractor neural model cannot explain band cells, which are a very nice side effect of the oscillatory interference model if you just drop some of the input. If it's just, or one of the inputs is stronger than the others, then you immediately get a band-like appearance. Meaning one of the inputs to the different dendrites, is that right? Uh, right. So if a cell just doesn't have these three different orthogonal dendrites, then you get band cells. Right. Is that right? I, for, I forget yeah. the exact numbers, but it's important to point out that uh, the majority of cells uh, the, that you can record in media and cortex have spatial periodicity, but they're not grid cells. They have a very low grid score. Right? There are some cells that are perfect grids, and they have a sizable fraction. They're like, I don't know, a quarter or something. Like maybe 23%, I think, if I remember correctly, are grid cells. But there's some 43% of cells that have some spatial periodicity, like a band Is it cell, for spatial example. periodicity or just spatial tuning? They, they fire at the same location every time, but are they periodic in a way? Uh, I actually, I, at least in the, in the overview that I saw from, I think it was O'Keefe, who had an overview of like you know a couple thousand cells combined from different studies? I think it just said spatially periodic cells. Okay. Um, anyways, so it's important that a model you know has an explanation for this. And the oscillatory interference can explain the continuous attractor or not. Yeah, it seems so to me the, the harder thing is to understand why you would. It, it almost seems harder to see why the, the, the you would end up with the sort of grid, perfect grid cellness. Um, the band cell seems more logical or right. Right, simple. And, and so it's a more interesting question is to say like, well, how, why does the brain even go towards this complete, um, you know, uh, hexagonal periodicity? Um, right. It's not clear to me why it would. Um, um, and then of course we have all these distortions in what they actually respond to. Uh, in the real environment, you come up boundaries and all kinds of weird stuff happen. So, it, it, this idea of this sort of a regular grid cell is almost like a, a mythology, or you know, it exists in some situations, but it seems to be misleading. As that, I mean, like twenty three percent is a sizable number. Yeah, but right? but it's also a subset, and they're also not always the same way, and they and they behave differently under right. different and environments. And they look really beautiful. I, I think this is an important topic. Like, yeah, that's no, an important I, topic. I agree. That, 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 like, all of these experiments where they find these nice grids are where rats are doing random foraging in a nice environment. Yeah. Like that's that's how they got the pretty grids. Uh, and yeah. So anyway, yeah. any kind of periodicity is important. I think that's essential for the whole grid cell 
methodology to work, right? For you to recode any uh, location in some unknown space. Uh, but this, this hexagonal form of it is, is odd, not clear, and maybe it's a big red herring because it, it, it appears, but even it's only 3% of the time in that environment, in those special environments, in regular environments, that the, in other things with the obstacles, they change. Yeah, so, so we're getting to about level 15. <laughs> right. Uh, so I'm thinking we can talk a lot about this, but I would like to go through this list. Um, so if you follow me on that. So interesting question is grid distortions. Obviously, it's quite easy to see how you would distort the firing field of an individual grid cell in an oscillatory interference model, simply by you know, having it anchored to a place cell, so that's why that's a tentative thing. But it's rather unclear. It, it seems that those distortions are coherent. So, uh, for example, with novelty, the entire grid expands, and it's not just one grid cell, right? It's all of them. Or if you open an environment uh, and you move a wall, right? It turns out that like the grid seems to stretch in that direction. Can that all really be explained by play cells? We're not so sure. Um, the continuous attract uh, network model is uh, is not all that much better in explaining these, but at least it's better in explaining that these are coherent because they're part of one big population attractor. And so I would tentatively say that the continuous attractive neural model is a bit better at that. Um, the transient global uh, scaling obviously can be explained in various ways. I mentioned, for example, the, the finding that the theta along the dorsal ventral gradient is actually a little bit different. The, the uh, intrinsic membrane oscillation is an additional H current characterized by, by Hasselhoff and the colloid The transient upscaling, what is that again? So the, the fact that the grid expands in novel environment. Oh, I thought right? you, I thought you what kind of a mechanism? I thought you were talking about that in the previous one. Could do that. Um, I'm talking about this one. Okay, and so, again, the continuous attractor neural model can explain that too. All that they require is a modulation of these head direction cells, these velocity inputs. So that is not, again, clearly shown, but it, there's clearly some kind of a mechanism to do it. So I will check it off on that regard. Um, this implementation of the CAM does not have a role for play cells and remapping. So on that account, it's a failure, but as Jeff pointed out, it's not inconceivable to say, let's take a crappy CAN model and add on similar, you know, kind of a correction of place cells. I would say it's 100 to 1 chance that that's what's going on. Yeah, so exactly. Let's, let's exactly. Because the brain is an integrated thing. Let's, it's let's, never one but thing. But that, right? that concept is so powerful that it almost certainly is true. So. Right. So you could make a similar argument that, you know, if you did that, then you could also get environmental anchoring of the grid, which has been well observed, right, uh, in, inside the CAM model. But again, like the, the model I reviewed here is not, doesn't show that explicitly, so I don't know if I should, you know, maybe that's a tentative crossing off. Yeah. Uh, similar thing goes towards the dependency, right? This model doesn't do it, but in theory, maybe you could build a model that did it just to overcome some of the weaknesses. Now, the, the things where this model really scores worst is, is all the extracellular uh, you know, weird electrophysiology. Like, it does not explain the much of the LFP or the theta rhythmicity. It doesn't really address theta precession at all. There is a model that has been tried to build it. So there's a, there's a researcher, oh my god, I forgot her name, uh, who actually built a model that, um, that does uh, Navratilova, there's a 2012 model, but it requires all kinds of uh, rather weird constructions, I think. So I'm, I'm, I'm doubtful that there's a good CAN model that you know, properly does uh, theta precession. Um, but these models don't have much of a problem of like, you know, explaining proper firing rates. Uh, I think they, they verified those things. Um, you know, why would you use a theta phase reset in such a model is <laughs> obviously um, a question. Now here's one thing that, um, that is sort of I added on. Because uh, one of the things that um, where the, the attractor neural network model is actually better, because it has it explains the inhibitory interneurons and what they do, you can explain the lateral disynaptic inhibition, which is very prominent in the sheet. So all this in, in inhibition where stellate cells inhibit each other, and as a result of that, you can also explain the out of field hyperpolarization, which has been observed that when you record the membrane potential that there's actually sizable inhibition when it's out of field. Um, and uh, well, it's unclear how you would get theta modulation in that, although we will get that in a hybrid model. And then uh, there's no account of the intrinsic membrane potential oscillations in the CAM model. 
Um, it's pretty clear how you would do speed in this model. Um, I don't think they explicitly demonstrated it though, so let me make that a tentative check mark. I think all of their, their simulated rap run at one speed. No, actually, they, they showed it at multiple speeds. So uh, I'll give that a straight check mark. Um, you know, you could do novelty expansion of the grid in similar ways by modulating that. Um, um, maybe just quickly for Jeff, since he missed it, oh, interesting, right. interesting marker for the CAM model is the observation that these uh, that the grid cells have sizable hyperpolarization when they're out of field. That is not well explained by an oscillator. Hyperpolarization. So they're inhibited strongly when they're not firing. And that is very obvious in a CAM model because CAM models have lateral dissynaptic oh, inhibitions okay. through all the inhibitory interneurons, and so this is easily explained. Um, which is a difference to the oscillatory interference model, which cannot really explain that uh, intracellular um, uh, membrane potential very well, even though it accounts for all the extracellular things very well, like the LFP and the phase precession. Um, there's no real, like, um, you know, a good question is, you know, how do we leverage fast plasticity, right? In the oscillatory interference one, there was a straightforward proposal how to use a fast, heavy learning rule to learn this kind of connectivity. I have yet to see a, a, a proposal for learning the rather specific connectivity that is required for integrating velocity inputs in the CAM model. So I'm going to cross this off. Obviously, it doesn't mean that one can't come up with a method for that, but it's going to be a lot more tricky. The CAM model obviously does not have an account for the theta cells which are the inputs to the oscillatory interference model. Um, and the model that we discussed here you know, didn't really address the, the, the hippocampal loop. Mm -hmm. And then the last three things here. Um, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's explanation for the dorsal ventral gradient of the intracellular membrane potential oscillations, which can be used to scale the grid, which might be one explanation for the fact that the grid scales along the dorsal ventral gradient of entrohyne cortex. Um, so that's speaking to the work of my colleague Eric uh, Francine and uh, Mike Hassel. Yeah, and these are not, these are, these are uh, uh, saltatory scaling. I mean, it's you got one scale and then instantly goes to another scale and instantly goes to another right. scale. It's exactly. not scaling along the, the dimension. It's, right, it's, it's not, not multiple scales. Yes, right. Right. It's, it's not continuous. continuous. It's just that they're multiple. And that's, right. that's not a hard thing to imagine. Right. But it's obviously, you know, not modeled in this kind of a model. Yeah, it's just, no it just yeah, it could be a, a genetic, it's evolutionary, just right. that's the right thing to do. Um, it is conceivable that you might use the particular neuromorphology of, you know, four to eight strong dendrites in a CAM model because, you know, you might need to integrate the, the correct head direction samples, so maybe you could implement something like that, although they don't really address it, you know, they treat it as a theoretical mathematical model. Uh, and I think that goes through the through the list of things that I have here. And the paper I, you showed, I think, it was like a 2009 paper. Is yes, right? um, so it's fairly old. Yes, it's fairly. I think old. they've kept evolving. Yes, they've models. kept evolving. As I mentioned, by the uh, there's like these attempts to put uh, the theta precession and whatnot in 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 these CAM models. But I think also some of these distortions and stuff they've they've dealt with. Right. Uh, well, I understand you models. start off by saying you're going to you're going to discuss paper that talked about a hybrid model. Mm -hmm. But you haven't, right? I mean, we've only talked about the camera. Yeah, because model I want to be very clear what the strength of the two models are, where they disagree and where they do agree, to point out. Is the, there a paper that talks about a hybrid model? Yes. And we haven't discussed that yet. No. Right. That's the third in the trio. It's driving me crazy for it. It's taking way too long to get there. I'm just letting you know. That's how I feel. I will be faster if you ask less questions. No, no, no. <laughs> just go right to this. I'm only there. I mean, I guess I'll, you know, I'm in my mind working out what the hybrid models are. Right. And um, the question is, what have they already done? And what, have we, what can we learn from that um, mm. is the question. Stay tuned for next time, I guess. <laughs> yeah, right. Good thing is the next one will be very short, because now you've already seen all the different mechanisms. Um, uh, and then in that sense, the explanation of the hybrid one will be rather quick. Even this is six years old. This is 2014. Yes, that's true. All right. Um, well, maybe we end it here, unless there's more questions. Thanks, Florian. Oh, thank you. All right. Uh, for anybody who, who's watching, I'll put out another video later with the full screen because the first part of this one was cut off. But thanks for watching. <laughs>
stop there in the stream. I, I did manage to get it back online, but we had good, good 14 people at the end there watching. We are offline. We are offline now. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. I can see.